Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. It's good to see all of you guys here. We are in chapter 8 of the book of Romans, which is uh, basically Paul's dissertation on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're in chapter 8, which begins, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, which is uh, a wonderful way to, to reach finally the heights of that. After going through chapter 7 and talking about the battle of the flesh and how the flesh once dominated us, we wanted to do what was right because we understood somehow in our hearts God's law, and yet we did not have the ability to do it. And yet, who saves us from this body of death? And praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we talked about being in the flesh and being in the spirit. So we talked about how the Holy Spirit has been put inside of us so that we don't do the things that we otherwise would do. Uh, praise God for that, or else we would just all be animals. And as we move into chapter 8, I'm calling this suffering in hope. There's a way to suffer where all you do is complain and focus in on the problem and then there's another way of suffering in hope. There's a way that we can embrace the thing that we're in because we know that it's not going to be the final state Hallelujah. where we will be. And so the scripture begins to talk about that in Paul here in chapter 8, and we'll talk about that. I almost named this the three groanings, <laughs> but that didn't sound nearly attractive enough to sell books. But it is. There are three groanings in here. We'll pick them out and talk about them. But first, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, to look into your word, to put the world aside, to put our own concerns and cares aside, and to focus in on you. We want to give you time, Lord, to plant new things, new ideas, new information, new perspectives into our hearts that we might see things as you do. Because very often, Lord, we look so closely at our own things that we lose focus of you. So, Lord, we want to just thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for your promises and for your word, which is just a revelation to us as to who you are. Help us to grow today, to know more of you, know more about you, and that you might have a larger piece of real estate in our minds and hearts. So, Lord, take us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The passage I brought up as a highlight scripture is in Romans 8, 23, which is even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Any of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's, uh, it's the older people that understand more than I do. <laughs> See, I put myself in the young category. Um, but I, I feel that because there's this groaning deep inside of me that I am not as I should be and I am not where I belong, that this is not my home. And if we forget that, we can get very frustrated with the things that are happening around us. But as we dive in, if you remember where we are, we're in chapter 8, which talks about sin and sanctification. We've gone through all of the rest, and I tell you that every week, and I don't want to kill you. So, previously what we went over was this, in verse 9, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So, we talked about that God has come in to take up residence in our body to become the temple of God. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. There is not a, sep a separate and subsequent spiritual experience. It happens when you accept Jesus Christ. The rest of it is in filling and discovery and growth. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So we don't do everything that our appetites, our imaginations, and our bodies tell us to do any longer because we're governed by the spirit. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You see, God never puts himself into a container and doesn't take it back at some point in time. And that's our hope that we will see the Lord and be with him because he's already come to take up residence in our body. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, 
For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And that is a permanent, eternal separation from God, not just a physical death. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live, and that is to have eternal life with God forever. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God or the children of God. One of the ways that you can tell that you're a Christian is if you are led by God's Spirit, which is inside of you. You don't do uh, what your appetite says. You don't think on worldly things because that ends up being death. What happens is you begin to think about spiritual things. And God, as he comes closer to us and our relationship grows, we think more on the things of heaven than we do about the things on the earth. And it doesn't make us of no earthly value or any earthly good. In fact, it makes us more worth uh, earthly value to think about heaven. So we talked about in verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, and that word Abba is the Aramaic meaning daddy. It's a, it would be an atrocity for anyone to call God daddy, and that's sort of a familiar uh, term if you don't have a relationship with him. And yet God asks us to come to him and refer to him by that name, which sounds like a child speaking to a dad, you know, or we call papa or, or dada. And that's the sort of familiarity that we have because we've been adopted. And I don't know if any of you have been adopted, but there's always this disparity when you're adopted because you never quite feel like you belong with the family that you're with unless you realize that God put you there. And then you come to grips with that. But we have been adopted, and I, I went through all these fearful characters throughout the scriptures that God selected and adopted, including the 12 disciples, well, at least 11 of them, Verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. There should be something inside of you. There should be someone inside of you that reaffirms God's relationship with you. And it doesn't mean that you don't ever feel bad because my goodness, we feel bad at times, don't we? And yet there should be this assurance in our hearts that we know the God of heaven who created everything and sent his son for us. If you don't have that assurance, if you don't have that reassurance, then maybe you don't know him. Because the spirit of God, if he lives in you, it will make an incredible change in your life and in your outlook on things. And so we looked at where he dwells. God dwells in us. New stuff, verse 17. And if children, or should it be since we are his children, then heirs... Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him or since indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You see, there's this incredible sharing between Jesus Christ and us. He shares his glory with us and, and we share his sufferings. And that's one of the exchanges that we have as Christians. The scripture talks of us as joint heirs. I don't know if any of you know what a joint heir is. It's uh, if you're in a will, and if anyone happens to leave you anything, be it parents or other folks, and they leave a last will and testament, they say, this is, this is what you can have, and this is what you can have, and this is what you can have. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'd, I haven't gotten anything out of a will yet. <laughs> and that's okay. And I don't anticipate ever will. Because I'm a joint heir with Christ. A joint heir with Christ. Well, that means that we share an inheritance with Jesus Christ. Well, what does Jesus inherit? Everything. Jesus Christ owns, created, and owns everything. And he says that we are joint heirs. You mean... We're going to share everything with Jesus Christ, a joint heir. You see, the scripture puts us on the same par as Jesus as far as our inheritance. That's, I, I don't need anything. I don't need anybody to leave me anything except for Christ. Colossians 1, 12 to 14 bears this out of our inheritance. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. For he has delivered us, 
from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Guys, we get everything. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ. I don't even want to be put on the same plane with Jesus Christ, but it says that he willingly shares it as a co-heir with you and with me. That's a lot. I'm going to have to share with Jesus everything. Well, that's an amazing thing. So, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. You see, we owe everything to Jesus. For the forgiveness of our sins, for the strength to live a righteous life, and also for the inheritance in which we will share with them. To him is due everything. It is for him and through him and to him are all things, right? It says in Hebrews 2.10, for it is fitting for him for whom all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Isn't it funny to think that Jesus being God, was perfected. How do you make God perfect? God's already perfect. But he never inhabited a human form and had to go through everything that you and I did. And Jesus suffered in the body to show us how to do it. He took away the punishment of our sin, but he showed us how we should suffer. He says, if somebody strikes you on one cheek, you should turn the other, right? He shows us how to suffer, and in so doing, we, we got to see the character of Jesus Christ. You know, you get to see really what's going on inside of you when you're going through difficult times. It's not when you have everything you desire and everything's comfortable. It's when you're missing things and you have needs and desires that you see really what's going on inside of you. And it's through these sufferings that we are made perfect as well. In fact, you would not know contentment had it not been that you ever suffered. You would never know it. You know what it is to be thankful because you know what it's like to be without those things. And as the forgotten holiday Thanksgiving comes, I call it the forgotten holiday because it seems we go right from the ghoulish October right into Christmas. Because there's nobody making a lot of money other than, you know, who's selling you a turkey on Thanksgiving. There's no money in that. So, you know, the world just fluffs it off. But Thanksgiving comes when you know what it's like to not have things. And then suddenly you do. And if we're co-heirs with Jesus Christ and we inherit heaven, we should be thankful. We should have thankfulness on our lips all the time. And we're made perfect through those things. For... I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Paul says, I've, I've been thinking about this and I've been thinking about the sufferings of my life and they're not even worthy to compare with what's going to happen and where we're going to be. It's not even worth thinking about. And he uses this interesting word, consider. It means to think. It means to weigh it out in your mind. And, and compare. Usually we don't, we don't do a very, very good job of comparing, you know. I'll, I'll be with my wife and we'll meet another couple and, you know, some tall, strong, handsome young man. And I go, wow, that guy's really tall and handsome and young. <laughs> I, I got none of that. We tend to compare poorly. And it tends to reflect badly on us. But he says, what I do is I look at the suffering that we're going through now, and I, I consider what's about to happen, and it's not even worthy. It, it doesn't balance out. It, it's not even worth worrying about. What a great attitude that is. You mean the riots, the election, COVID, all of these things? Well, those things are nothing, really, but we get all focused on them and all twisted up on them. 
because what's about to happen after our short little lives is eternity with God and sharing all things with Jesus Christ. So I don't even consider the sufferings that I'm going through right now worthy to be compared. I, they, they're not even, I, I can't even put them on the same sheet of paper. So 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 29. Now, this is Paul writing, okay? The same guy that's writing, Romans. And he's been through some stuff, some suffering. And he says, this suffering that I go through isn't even worth thinking about. Now, see if you've been in, through anything like this. He says, are they ministers of Christ? He's talking about these false teachers that have arisen in the church. And he goes, I'm speaking as a fool. He goes, I'm about to say something stupid here, so just bear with me. I am more of a minister of Christ. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In other words, I've been beaten so often, I don't even know how often I've been beaten. In prisons, more frequently. Now, that's never a good thing to put on your resume, but he says, I've been in prison more frequently, and it's for Jesus Christ and for his namesake. In deaths, often. How many can you say, I've died often? I've often died. I, I understand the whole experience. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Oh, that's great. So five times 39. Who's, who's the math whiz? Okay. He's been beaten five times. 39 lashes. They leave that 40 off just, just to be merciful. Three times I was beaten with rods. We're talking about thick, heavy sticks. Once I was stoned, not with marijuana. <laughs> People picked up stones and pummeled him with that until he laid down dead on the pavement. That's the death's often part. Three times I was shipwrecked. I don't know about you, but that's one of the worst feelings I could think of. A night and a day I have been in the deep. He means the open sea, floating around. A day and a night, 24-hour period, floating around in the sea. I mean, all I would hear is Jaws music. <laughs> <laughs> boom, 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 for 24 hours. In journeys, often he's been in peril. In perils of waters, well, of course. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. These are, these are supposedly his friends and neighbors. In perils of the Gentiles, those who hated his guts. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren, people who try to snuggle up to be your friend and then stab you in the back. In weariness and toil, he's talking about physical work. In sleeplessness, often. In hunger and thirst, in fastings, often. In cold and nakedness. Now, this is, not a, this is not a name and claim it sermon at all. Besides all the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. His heart goes out and he prays faithfully for all of these folks that he shared the scripture with. And he says, it, I, I have to off-burden this stuff to the Lord all the time. Who is weak? And I'm not weak. Who is made to stumble? And yet I don't burn with indignation. He says, I'm not all ticked off about this. I'm not all twisted up. I'm not full of complaints. I'm not all upset. So who of you has got a, who, who have you got a problem? <laughs> Paul says, well, which one of you really has the problem? Who's stumbling? Who's really struggling? Who's, who's got the problem? Y'all, I'm okay. So if it's okay for him, it should be okay for us. But here's the secret. It's keeping our eyes on the Lord. Amen. And he says, I don't even think that I can compare the sufferings of now to the glory that will be revealed because the glory is so much more. Now, this is what Paul went through, and he says, I don't even consider them to be put on the same page. Well, then what do you got? I feel like I have no room to complain when I read this. And it doesn't matter what I'm going through. And he kept going. 
like, like the Ever Ready Bunny. I mean, he just went. I don't even consider the sufferings of this present time that they're worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now that's a compound sentence. <laughs> Let's take it apart. First of all, he says, there is this earnest expectation of the creation as it eagerly waits. If you remember in the Garden of Eden, when Eve took the fruit and gave to her husband and sin entered the world, there were curses that fell upon Eve, the snake and Eve and Adam and this earth. Thorns and thistles infested the ground and it won't give fruit like it once did. Your your conception and your pain in delivery will be increased. So ladies, you know, giving birth to children, uh, it's gonna be grievous. Not only that, but we give birth, you give birth to little sinners, <laughs> which is grievous for the rest of your life. <laughs> but you see creation, everything that God created in its perfect form got ruined when we decided to step off and do our own thing. Do you understand? Not only are you groaning inside yourself, wishing to be clothed with your eternal body and be with the Lord, but creation groans. Isn't that interesting? It kind of gives a personification to nature and the earth itself that it groans. And actually the word earnest expectation, it means to have with one's neck extended and head out like you're looking around the corner, like you're playing hide and seek with your granddaughter and you're going. <laughs> That's what it says we do. I don't know about you, but I don't do that enough. I don't, today, Lord? And I wonder if we did, if it wouldn't change the course of our day. You know, like, You remember when Eve and Adam were in the garden and everything got ruined, the earth, the animals. It says that eventually that will all be restored and it says that the lion will lie down with the lamb. And it says a little child will play in a den of vipers and not be harmed. The animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, everything on the earth got contaminated and then we didn't help it by making vehicles that emit emissions. Most things made out of plastic. We didn't help the earth either. But it says God is also not just gonna redeem us, but he's gonna redeem the earth. And not only do we groan, but the earth groans. I think that's a rather interesting thing because we were cast out of the Garden of Eden. So perfection is something we ruined and contaminated with our sin. And we continue to contaminate things with our sin, even though we're delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's this thing, this expectancy that we're not in the place where we belong, that things are not as they should be. You guys understand that, right? You feel that? And I think about the creation. I think about the beautiful places in the earth I mean, if you've ever been traveling around this planet and seen some beautiful places, there are some really beautiful places in this world. By the way, that's contaminated compared to what the Lord's going to do when he redeems it, which is like, what? I mean, I, th I think of whether it doesn't matter if you go into the mountains or if you go down by the sea or you're looking at a sunset. There are some beautiful things that God created, and there is still some semblance of God's creative signature in this world. 
and yet all of it is contaminated because of sin. And so the best of what we have is going to be even better when we get to heaven. So I can't even conceive of what that's like. But the earth groans and longs to be redeemed. Isn't that interesting? I, th I find that very interesting. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Isn't it interesting creation groans almost like Mother Nature is going to give birth, you know, or, the, or Mother Earth is going to give birth. The earth groans. I think it's interesting because you can see the groaning everywhere. In fact, we know that in the end times that there are going to be earthquakes. There's going to be stars that fall from the sky. There's going to be all kinds of crazy stuff with the earth, and that's the earth going into a final push right before Christ comes back and redeems the world. But I think about the earthquakes that take place that totally devastate anything that man tries to build, and it doesn't matter how well it's built. If it's over one story, you're susceptible. And I think of when that happens out in the ocean and how you get these giant waves that come in and just decimate everything in their path, um, I, f I find it kind of awesome to see that sort of destruction as we go about our day and pretend that, you know, the most important thing that we have to do is check Facebook and see who likes us. <laughs> and all of this stuff happens and we start to realize that there are way more important things than our little puny lives and the things that we think are so important and get caught up with in this world. If you remember Sandy, when Sandy blew through, this is actually an actual house from when Sandy came through uh, here on the Jersey Shore. And that changed everything. It changed everything for a lot of people because you begin to think about really what's important. And of course, years go by and it's behind you and then you don't think about it, but everything in this world, people, things, and creation, everything is waiting for the Lord to redeem us, for the redemption of the sons, which is us. Most people think Mother Nature is just trying to kill you. <laughs> but what it is is that the earth is going through labor pains, and it's going to get worse and worse until the Savior comes and takes us home. So this is definitely not our home and a place to get comfortable. Well, not only that, but we also have who are the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So this is the second groan. First of all, creation is groaning. Second of all, we groan. You guys, you guys groan? Mm. You ever get hungry and your stomach starts making noises? Yeah, I, I hardly ever do that because I'm hardly ever hungry. <laughs> I've always got something in there. <laughs> but you, your stomach can groan and make sounds, you know, uh, and there are some people that tend to have it more than others. But it says here that we who have the Spirit in ourselves, we groan inwardly. Do you guys have that yearning and desire to be with the Lord? I, I, sometimes that overtakes me when I'm praying and when I'm with the Lord. It's like, you know, do we have to do this again? Can, can I just come home? <laughs> And yet, he reassures me, no, no, you got to go up and speak today. So I was like, okay. But we groan because our physical bodies are wearing out. I don't know about you, but uh, I've got, most of those are damaged. So we groan, and it's either a physical thing that we groan, or it's a spiritual failure. It's a moral issue where we've let the Lord down some way, shape, and form, and, and we're just sick and tired of trying. You guys ever feel that way? And we groan to be clothed. And, you know, I, I can't believe I, you know, snapped at my wife and I said that thing or I, I thoughtlessly forgot about this person over here or whatever. And we groan. And 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18 says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. That is the Christian experience. 
for our light affliction. Now, this is Paul writing again with all the experience of being afflicted, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You see, because when we endure by the Spirit of God, Jesus gets glory for that, doesn't he? While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And I don't know about you, but I tend to get my eyes on the things I can see and the things that are around me and things that are happening today. And, you know, the concerns, I got my to-do list and I have my schedule. And we can become so absorbed with the now that we don't realize that now is completely subservient to later. And it's difficult. And we can groan. I know that Jesus himself wept as he was here. If you remember him in Matthew, he's coming upon the city of Jerusalem where he knows he's going to be captured, hung on a cross and die. He wept over the city. And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have often wanted to take you like a mother takes her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. And he weeps over the city. He weeps that the city will be torn down and not one stone will be left upon another. He weeps at the fact that the hardness of their hearts was such that they did not receive him. And I think, my goodness, Jesus knew what it was to groan inwardly when he was in the garden and he said, Father, if this cup can pass for me, but not my will, thy will be done. And he sweated great drops of blood out of his pores. The tension was so heavy upon him. He knows what it is to groan inwardly. And he turned to his heavenly father. We should do the same. Not keeping our eyes on the things that are temporary, but the things that are permanent. Because the things that are temporary are, are of this world. In Hebrews 12, 2 to 4, it says, Looking unto Jesus which is how we do it, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then we're given this bit of advice, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So we're to consider Jesus and everything he went through because he made it. He, he went through the finish line. He did it and he did it well. And we're supposed to think on him and how he did it so that we don't become weary in our souls. And if we just look at now and we look at ourselves, we can certainly get that way. And yet you have not resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. I mean, I haven't submitted to torture, you know, deny Jesus Christ or I'll torture you or I'll, you know, fillet you or take your skin off or I'll pierce your, your hands and, and your feet. I haven't resisted temptation to that point, but Jesus did. And so we can look to him because he is a worthy savior to give us strength in time of need. Amen. Amen. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. What Paul's doing is giving us an understanding of what hope is. You know, most of us think that hope is, you know, I, I hope he finishes soon. <laughs> or I, I, I hope we're having steak for lunch. Or, you know. <laughs> It's, it's this wish, it's this kind of a, it's a desire that's kind of spoken. But hope in the scriptural sense is a future certainty of a coming good. A future certainty of a coming good. That's what hope really is. It is an absolute settled understanding that this thing will happen in the future. That's what Jesus did when he was on the cross and endured the shame. He knew that he knew that he knew that he was going to be with the Father. Although he struggled with the feelings, he said, yet not my will be done, but thy will be done. 
And that's what we do. We do this very same thing. But we can't do it when we have our eyes on ourselves and we're all concerned about our own needs and our own you know, desires and if we live according to the flesh. So we have this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. I mean, you know, if you see it, it's not hope. It's like Christmas Day, you're not hoping. It's there. It's Christmas Day. You're not hoping for something because there it is. And so hope is one of those things that it's always kind of a day away, like Annie says. Hope is always in front of us. And when you look around our world and you think about just death and how death is the end of our physical experience here on the earth, and it's happening to everyone. And one by one, people will leave your lives. And as you get older, you'll have less and less friends that are your age. And pretty soon it'll seem like only you. That's a very despairing thing. All of your family, those that you love, those that you care about, one by one, will eventually go away. Or it'll be you, if you have enough of them under you, uh, younger than you. And it's one of those despairing things. I think about cancer. I think about COVID. I think about all of these things and how death takes people. And then we're left to have to struggle through what to do with their memory. Whether they know the Lord or they don't know the Lord. If they know the Lord, we should be joyous because, you know, they, they crossed the, the tape before we did. And they're, they're well, honestly. Amen. But without the Lord there's this grief that their soul has been lost forever and they have thrown away their opportunity to come to know the Savior. And that is a desperate, despairing thought. And yet, it, it can stifle us. And then when it happens to us, fear is one of those things that tends to take over. But death isn't the end if you know the Savior. Death is the beginning. And if we're not careful, we can get so focused on today that we forget there's a tomorrow with the Lord. I think about the riots that are happening and, you know, the defund police movement and the, uh, all, of the, all of the craziness that's going out on the street. And, you, you know, the police are cra clashing with protesters and all of the mess that we see going on. You know, the earth is going through birth pangs. And we shouldn't be surprised that it gets worse. doesn't mean that we shouldn't affect change and try to change it. But I think people's souls are desperate enough that you can share with them about Jesus Christ, and they're more receptive now than ever before. So I don't see that all of this is tragedy. I see part of it as opportunity, because people know struggling with the virus and worrying if you're going to be the next one who gets it. I don't know about you. I get a little something in my throat, and I go, <clears throat> oh. I got the COVID. <laughs> Listen, a few months back, I woke up coughing. I think I swallowed my own spit in my sleep or something. And, and I woke up and I was, I, I was half asleep and half awake. And I said, I, I got it. I got it. My life hangs on the balance. That's it. I'm done. That's it. I'm still young, kind of. I had, I had all these thoughts running through my mind about that's it, I'm done, because I woke up with a cough. Or, or somebody coughing in line at the, at the grocery store, you know, <laughs> and you go. It's the, I'll tell you what, you need some room, just cough. And it's because everyone is so afraid and so focused on today. I mean, don't you want to get to tomorrow? Huh, praise the Lord, I got COVID. Maybe this is it. <laughs> Why didn't I wake up saying that? Because I wasn't focused on that. I was focused on today and now and immediate. So it's a confession. And of course, there's the election, <clears throat> which is messed up. And you get to see the evil of human beings coming to the height on both sides. You got armed militia, kidnapping people of prominence. You have people in the street. 
you have all sorts of questions about whether the election was rigged, whether it was stolen, whether it was real, it was not. You got people making up their own laws everywhere. And you know what it shows? Human beings are sinners. Every single one of them. And yet it's so surprising. We're like, oh, I thought we had free and fair elections. <laughs> Democracy, is it an illusion? I use such desperate words to go to the height of craziness so that you understand that it's all not even worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed. Amen. But the more you talk about it, the bigger it seems to get, kind of like a penny, right? You know, the closer you look at it, the bigger it gets until it blocks out the entire earth. <laughs> but that's the way that we are because we don't think about eternal. We think about temporal. We think about today. But he says, we have this hope, and because it is our hope, we hold on to it with perseverance, which means you better hold on, because the world's going to try to rip that hope away from you. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, there's the third groaning, which cannot be uttered. They can't be uttered. You can't come up with words. You can't come up with sounds. You can't come up with anything. Just, just like your stomach rumbling. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You see, the Spirit of God which is inside of you groans as well. Not only does the earth groan because it wants to be made new, not only do you groan because you want to be made new, but the Spirit of God inside of you groans. Isn't that interesting? I didn't realize that the Spirit of God groans, but he does. And I think that's why the Scripture tells us that we should not seek to grieve the Holy Spirit. Because when we decide to drag ourselves into something, we drag the Holy Spirit of God with us. When we present our members as instruments of sin instead of righteousness, we drag the Holy Spirit through all that. You know, when I decide that I'm going to have a tantrum or whatever, I'm dragging the Holy Spirit through that. And I think the Holy Spirit groans as well, usually from my own actions. But it says the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, and aren't you glad for that? Yes. You know, there are, I, without the Holy Spirit in my life, I would just be an animal. I'm sure I would not be alive today. But I praise God that he helps us in our weakness. He helps you in your weakness. What's your weakness? I got a list but the Spirit helps me. So if you see strength in my life, if I see strength in your life, I know where it comes from. It comes from the Lord himself. Because in and of yourself, you just don't have the strength. But the Spirit helps us and helps us to pray. And the Spirit intercedes. Isn't that interesting? The Spirit prays for us things that we can't even understand or verbalize. The Spirit of God communes with God the Father, and he tells him what's going on inside of us and what we need. And there's this connection, even though you don't feel it, even though you don't have the words, you don't have the understanding, you don't have the theology, you don't have the... the have you ever heard somebody who's like a professional prayer? It's a combination of words and sounds that are usually round. Oh, Father. We beseech thee. Of course, there's got to be King James in there. <laughs> the one who has power. You know, like there's, there's just, just this giant presentation of dram dramatics in prayer. And yet the Holy Spirit prays with groanings. Doesn't even use words. It's like, ugh. I don't know about you, but I say Lord a lot. Lord, 
you know. That's my, that's my high prayer right there. Because you know what? That comes from my soul. It comes from the spirit of God inside of me. It's, uh, again, really? I've heard your prayers. Come on. I've heard that one too. But the spirit of God prays in a way that is simple and effective. And I think, my goodness, we could learn from the Spirit of God how to pray. Like a child, to just roll it out, just write. Uh, we had a guy named Eddie who died, and he used to pray. He was, a, he was a young believer, and he said, Hi, God, it's me, Eddie. It's just, he was like 20 years old, yeah. But he was just so from his heart, talking to the Lord. He wasn't putting on a performance for anybody. He didn't know the Christianese lingo. You know, he, he wasn't full of scriptures he was spouting. He was just from his gut talking to God, and you just happened to be there. And I think that's the way the Spirit communes for us, with groanings that can't even be uttered. The world groans, we groan, and the Spirit of God groans, I believe, for us to be reunited with the Lord and for him to be back. And I think of, um, that's a prayer meeting, actually, that was held in Washington, D.C. in May. I think I believe it was May 5th. But being able to commune and pray to the Lord is one of the greatest advantages and one of the most awesome privileges that we have. And we get to tell God what's on our heart. And believe me, he hears you even when you don't have the words. And you can do this all day long. My car is one of the more sacred places, along with the bathroom. Because <laughs> I tend to be alone and it's quiet. And you can just lift your heart up to the Lord and know that you don't have to have the verbiage. And you don't have to have the voice. Moses. You know, you don't have to have, you just tell God what's going on in your heart and he already knows anyway. So just be yourself. Hey God, it's me. There was a story in Florida where this uh, young man, this black man, was at a restaurant and there was a police officer that was uh, eating there with his family at lunch hour. And this young man was prompted to go pray for him. This young black man went over and said, can I pray for you? And the officer said, yes. And they bowed their heads, and this young man, who was on fire for Jesus, prayed for him in the spirit, with love, and his whole family, including this young man, began to weep just overwhelmed by the Spirit of God as he prayed for him. This black man who might feel like he's a target of the police at some point in time, and the police officer felt like this young man might be coming up with a, a knife because that's the usual thing on the street. People coming up to you usually don't have good intents and had a moment with the Lord. And I think, my goodness, how many of those do we miss because we're just so involved with our own stuff? We need to be more heavenly minded. We need to be more future forward in our thinking and not get so tied up into things of this world. Next week, Romans 8, 28. <laughs> For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. Another big, complex, compound sentence that we'll unpack, and hopefully you guys will be with us next week. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. If the Spirit of God has been speaking to your heart today, 
that the things in your life are much bigger than they should be. You could change that right now. Take whatever it is that you believe that the Lord spoke to your heart personally today, bottle it up and take it with you. Write it down. Spend some time with the Lord today talking about it and digesting it. I've found that to be one of the most helpful things for myself is to meditate on the things that the Lord reveals in this hour because I believe that the Spirit of God speaks in this time in a way that is different than the rest of the week. I'm banking on it. Pray that the Lord would bless us with a fresh revelation of who he is. Mm -hmm.